I'm Claire from Eternal Magpie and today we're going to fall down a little rabbit hole that I came across while I was working on my dissertation, a recipe made from moss which grows on a skull, obviously. So here it is on the screen from the 1597 edition of Gerard's Herbal and I will read it out loud for you. This kind of moss is found upon the skull or bare scalps of men and women lying long in charnel houses and other places where the bones of men and women are kept together. It groweth very thick, white, like unto the short moss upon the trunks of old oaks. It is thought to be a singular remedy against the falling evil and the chin cough in children, if it be powdered and then given in sweet wine for certain days together little bit vague at the end there but that's the recipe so now let's have a little bit of context to go with it so a charnel house is a place where human skeletal remains are stored basically uh, another name for it is an ossuary you might be familiar with the uh, 19th century catacombs in Paris or the much much older 14th century Sedlec ossuary in the Czech Republic uh, just outside Prague. Places like these were used when space for burial was scarce. Bones would be exhumed and then stored in a dedicated building or in a chamber below a church and this freed up the ground for new burials. In England most of these sites have now been emptied and the bones have been reburied elsewhere although there are a few remaining. Uh, there's one dating to the late 1600s at Hythe in Kent, which is now closed for the winter, but it reopens at Easter. You can also visit the 13th century Rothwell Charnel Chapel one Sunday a month, or if you can't make it to Northamptonshire in person, a team of archaeologists from the University of Sheffield have created an amazing digital fly-through which you can view online. And the links to all of these places that I've just mentioned are in the description below if you want to find out more. Uh, and there's also an article about the history of charnel houses by Thomas Farrow from the University of Chester. So links below, check those out. So what about the illnesses that the remedy is supposed to cure? Chin cough is now commonly known as whooping cough and Thomas Sydenham named it pertussis in 1679. Its bacterial cause wasn't discovered until the early 20th century and a vaccine followed soon after. So it's particularly dangerous for infants and here in the UK babies and pregnant people are now routinely vaccinated for whooping cough. The falling evil is a very old name for epilepsy. Its cause wasn't known in the 17th century, but medicines for epilepsy come up extremely frequently in early modern herbals and recipe books. The index to the 1633 edition of Gerard's Herbal, this one here, um, references 44 entries, which include remedies for epilepsy. In the pharmacopoeias, which were the medical textbooks of the time, between the 16th and the 18th centuries, there are several mentions of the use of powder made from the human skull itself, and Paracelsus recommends this powder, skull powder, um, as an ingredient in a remedy for the cure of epilepsy. So it makes sense, in the terms of Gerard's herbal, that a remedy for whooping cough would also be considered appropriate for epilepsy because in some cases, and again particularly in infants, uh, severe whooping cough can also cause seizures. The index of the herbal takes us to just three remedies for whooping cough. Uh, the first one is for moneywort boiled in wine and mixed with honey or mead that you then drink. The second is stinging nettles which are made into a louche or licking medicine. Um, so a licking medicine was a kind of syrup which you literally licked from a spoon or a stick um, and these are commonly recommended for relieving a cough and to be honest that sounds that sounds quite nice to me. Um, the third remedy 
that's listed in the index is a decoction of juniper berries, which you make by boiling the berries in liquid that you can then drink. Sometimes the liquid is wine and sometimes it's water, in which case you've just made yourself a nice cup of herbal tea. However, the index to the 1633 edition of Gerard's Herbal isn't 100% accurate as it doesn't actually include the entry for page 1563, which is where we find the mossy skull. Gerard does recommend the moss which grows on a skull rather than Paracelsus's powdered skull itself and moss in general was quite a common ingredient in Tudor medicine. Uh, French pharmacist Pierre Pommet named this particular moss Usnea because of its resemblance to oak moss, which Gerard also mentions. In fact, we now know that this moss is actually a lichen, uh, many species of which will grow quite happily on bone. This might explain why also in the 1597 and 1633 editions of Gerard's Herbal, the moss is described as white but in 1636, it's been amended to say green. Um, Paolo Modenesi has written a journal article investigating exactly which species of lichen might have been used in medicine in the early modern period. And he says that, and this is a quote, the obvious conclusion, since it was impossible to distinguish between mosses and lichens, is that from the 16th to the 19th centuries, apothecaries used anything that grew on a human skull for their concoctions, be it a lichen or a moss. Both lichens and mosses are pioneer macroorganisms and can thrive on a bare, rugged, calcium-based substrate, which is, after all, simply a variation of an exposed, rocky substrate. So there you go, lichens and mosses on skulls. And I've popped the link for Modenesi's article in the description, although um, I don't think this one's open access, I'm afraid, so you might not be able to read um, anything more than just the abstract, but I've popped all the links down there so that you can go and find out some more. So that's the remedy. And the other interesting thing about the moss growing upon the skull of a man is the image which has been used to illustrate it. There we go. There it is. Lovely skull, lovely moss hat. Very smart. So in the 1597 edition, we can see the big ball of moss, and the skull with its little mossy hairdo, and there's text on either side of the skull, which appears to have been carved directly into the image block. On the left, if you will excuse my terrible accents here, it says Moss von Todenkopf, and on the right, it says Muscus ex craneo humano, so moss on a skull, basically, in both cases. Now, in the 1633 and 1636 editions, the text on the left has disappeared. Gone. No longer printing in the book. Just gone. There you go. There it isn't, I guess. There we go. So... This brings up two questions. One, why? Uh, and two, how? Always good questions to ask. So the why is probably unanswerable, to be honest, unless there just happens to be some kind of explanatory letter in the archives of the publishers, which seems extremely unlikely. Although, to be fair, I haven't looked, so you never know. The how, is also tricky and there are several potential options. I'm going to use this lino cut as a stand-in for a wood block so you can see what I mean. So if we assume that the image and the text are all carved onto a single block of wood, the German text could have been carved or sanded away so that it was below the level of the rest of the image and it wouldn't pick up any ink during the printing process. So it would just literally be completely erased. So you can see with this lino cut, everything that's been cut away won't print because there's nothing there to print. 
but if the publishers didn't want to damage the block so that they could use it again intact in the future, they could have masked out the text with a scrap of paper stuck to the block so that again it wouldn't pick up any ink. However, if the text was still there, you would still be able to see a blank impression of the letters. You would see the outline where they'd pressed into the paper, or you would see an outline of the blank piece of paper that was used to sort of mask them out. Now, I've only seen one copy each of the 1633 and the 1636 editions in the flesh, and I wasn't able to spot any kind of blank impression from letters which had been masked or not inked. I mean, obviously two copies is not in any way a scientific sample size, uh, but it seems unlikely to me that, that, that this is what happened, especially since you'd have to repeat the masking process every single time you re-inked the page, which will be a lot of fiddly extra work to do. Now another option is that the image is not carved into one block, but onto separate ones. It's a little bit hard to tell from photographs because they're sort of distorted slightly by the curvature of the page, but if you place a grid over the image, like so, you can see that none of the elements overlap with one another. So I've put these very thin little red lines in to show you the gaps between each section of that woodblock. And that means that they could potentially have been carved into entirely separate blocks, which were then put together on the page. In that case, the, the block containing the text on the left could easily have been swapped out for a blank piece of furniture, leaving the skull and the text on the right in the same places. However, while a lot of the image in Gerard's Herbal are carved right up to the edges of the block, uh, which can lead to some delightfully rectangular plants <laughs> like uh, this St John's wort, which is growing in my garden and I can assure you it is not rectangular. Um, but both the, if you look, both the ball of moss and the tops of the lettering in both languages are so very close together that there's barely even a hairline in between them. So because of that, my personal conclusion is that the missing text was physically removed from the block at some point between 1597 and 1633. And perhaps the same block was used in another herbal, which didn't need the extra text, but then, I don't know, why not remove both? But um, renting and reusing um, carved wood blocks like these was very common. So this one may not have actually belonged to the publishers of Gerard's Herbal, so they might not have had any control over that image being removed. But beyond that, I have absolutely no idea, frankly. So if you're also doing research into early modern herbals or printing history, what do you think is going on? Have you seen this image in any other books? I would really love to know what you think. <laughs>